You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. Happy Monday. This is Mondays at the Overhead Wire, sponsored by our super generous Patreon supporters. I'm Jeff Wood, your host, and joined by Han Solo. That's right. Every Wookiee's favorite right-hand man is here to flash back into Talking Headways, episode 355 from back in October of 2021. Since it's Labor Day, we've got a flashback Talking Headways. Next week, we'll be back at the Monday show with a special guest. That is not Han Solo, so stay tuned. But this week, we're chatting with Kenneth O'Reilly about his book, Asphalt, A History. We chatted about what asphalt is, how it was used for building, war, and economic expansion, and how it affects the future of our planet. 94% of our roads are asphalt, and they are 100% recyclable. You can get this book and help us out by going to our bookshop.org page and ordering this or any book you like bookshop.org slash shop slash the overhead wire. Check it out if you get a chance. Also, thanks again to our Patreon members and listen in everybody because uh, we'll have a special guest next week. We'll hope you hopefully see you there. Well, Kenneth O'Reilly, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is great. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a historian. I've been uh, my te- and I've been around a long time. I still go out and run every day and bike every day, but I've been teaching since 1973. I had a couple years off here and there. I'm retired from the University of Alaska, and now I'm teaching at uh, Milwaukee Area Technical College, and I'm probably going to retire from there too in December. I figure enough's enough, like 45 (laughs) years of teaching. I grew up in New York City where we used to play baseball and asphalt and stickball and handball and all of that and roller skate and roller hockey. So it's asphalt's been part of my life from from the get-go. Then we moved to Michigan. And uh, as I got older, I switched to basketball. And again, you play outdoors. Back then, a lot of basketball was played outdoors. Now they have AAU teams for high scores and stuff. But back then, it was all asphalt ball. And graduate school in Milwaukee at Marquette University, Jesuit school. And then job offers came in, and they're few and far between. It's not easy to get a job in the humanities on the university level. I had a few offers, but I thought, I'll take the one that would be the biggest adventure. And so we moved to Alaska, and it was a big adventure. We had our kids up there, and my wife was a flight nurse up there, and so it was absolutely fascinating. And, of course, Alaska, they have their own asphalt story as well. And a, a few asphalt adventures in Alaska made it into my book as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I want to talk to you about the book, Asphalt, A History. I'm curious when you started seeing asphalt, not just in the background, because it, it obviously it permeates everything, but as kind of a topic for a book. I mean, something that you saw it said, hey, I, I see this topic and I want to write about it. Well, there's two things, really. Uh, and one, I have to make a confession. By picking asphalt, I got to write about what I want to write about because it's everywhere. And so I got to pick and choose. Like I get to write about the Vietnam War. I get to write about World War I, World War II. I get to write about Watergate. I mean, asphalt, it hooks into pretty much absolutely everything. And the second thing is, you know, nowadays uh, with the internet, the publishing opportunities are, are fewer and further between, especially what I do. I do political history. And by looking at asphalt, that's sort of a backdoor into political history, because my book is an environmental history, but I take a political angle at it. Right. And also in the discipline, writing about everyday things is pretty common. I mean, there are books about salt. I'm working on a new book now about milk, of all things. But again, I'm taking a political angle. I'm working at milk wars, dairy wars, price wars, gangsters, teamsters, you name it. So again, asphalt. And then once I started getting into asphalt, I, I, I get all these little things that I didn't really know, like Cleopatra was in the asphalt business, right? That they use asphalt to coat the casing seams on the Nagasaki atomic bomb. And so it just keeps popping up for good reasons and bad reasons. And basically the book I wrote is dualistic. Asphalt actually has some good traits 
you know, I believe in the environmental movement. I believe global warming is real and all that. So that's hard for me to say that, you know, a fossil fuel has some good traits, but it does. On the other hand, it has some really bad sides to it as well. And the, the main bad side is, um, you know, we're basically paving the earth. And that changes our structure. And in theory, asphalt could fix that very easily in theory. And we already have permeable or porous asphalt, which would allow rainfall and water runoff to go right back into the earth where water belongs. But the problem with that is porous asphalt clogs and basically breaks down under load and under water. Water going through it great for a while, but then it clogs and expenses to fix it are outrageous. And so we're, we're basically stuck with it. And without paving, of course, if you don't have asphalt, it's the most common paving material. Concrete pavement is also common, but not nearly as common as asphalt. Asphalt of the paved roads in the United States, asphalt covers about 94% of them. And again, paving it on one level is horrible for the environment. On another level, if you don't have paving, you have other environmental issues focusing around simple things like mud and dust. And those can create e enormous environmental problems. So it's sort of a dilemma and that we know how to fix in theory permeable pavement, but permeable pavement doesn't really work because it just clogs too easily, breaks down too easily. I noticed that, you know, if you wanted to get a, um, a U.S. history and maybe some Caribbean history primer, you could, you know, go through the book and, and kind of get a basic history <laughs> from the book in sure. addition to the history of asphalt. You know, you mentioned that you're interested in the history and, and you kind of woven that together, but I'm curious what surprised you the most about weaving together this kind of intricate history all the way from the start of civilization to current times? Well, the thing that surprised me the most, other than little tidbits like Cleopatra, was how valuable Nazi Germany thought asphalt was. Now, when I'm doing, I have a chapter on the New Deal in World War II, and so I was kind of shocked at the amount of asphalt in 55-gallon drums that landed with our troops on D-Day. Because to move the troops, we paved. And so we put in construction equipment. But I was even more shocked at the importance Nazi Germany gave to asphalt for their war effort, but also for the Holocaust. And that was kind of surprising. And some of the details are really gory and gross. And you don't really, I don't really want to talk about them. But it's hard enough writing about them. But as a war material, uh, asphalt has a, has a big, big history. And for um, Nazi Germany, probably the biggest thing was the Nazis tried to hollow out asphalt mines. Asphalt is a natural substance, like the La Brea tar pits. Uh, that's asphalt. The tar sands or oil sands up in Canada, they call it bitumen or bitumen or bitumen. It's pronounced different ways, but it's really asphalt. And so you have natural asphalt. And in Germany, you, you got some old asphalt mines where uh, corporations like Deutsche Asphalt would dig and, you know, crack the asphalt out of the earth and go process it and sell it. And Nazi Germany tried to hollow out some of those mines in order to move in armament production into those mines to be safe from Allied bombers during the war. Now, I didn't discover that. I discovered it from, for me, but, mm -hmm. you know, that was in fact known already. I just didn't know it. And Porsche and Volkswagen and companies like that were all involved. So I'm that surprising. I think the interesting thing, well, maybe the weirdest piece was a part about the mummy embalming and then later on people selling crushed mummy skull as like a, either an aphrodisiac yeah. or some sort of weird snake oil. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty weird. But I guess the medieval period, right, where they had leeches and, and bloodletting and all that and superstition was, was rampant. But the dominant theory is what happened is Egypt didn't have too many trees to begin with. And when they started running out of trees they started out of running out of resin that they used for you know as part of the embalming process so they turned to asphalt at least for commoners and in egypt lots of people you know rich and poor alike were mummified even mummified fetuses for god's sakes mm -hmm. so and so uh, during the the late period in ancient egypt yeah the asphalt was used fairly commonly in mummification and it's pretty 
pretty weird. And you have tales of explorers and others entering these pits where common people were, were mummified and buried, and you have asphalt dripping from the ceiling and things like that. And every, it's just, yeah, it's, it's creepy. It's creepy to write about. <laughs> Not everybody sees it as creepy, but I, I sure did. <laughs> Well, I guess I should ask a, a basic question that's like, a, after reading the book, I realize it's complicated, but what is asphalt? What is it exactly? Because there's lots of terms for it. There's bitumen and, and and then, you you know, for the road paving, there's asphalt, black tar- tarmac, et cetera. Sure. There's like 200 yeah. different synonyms for asphalt. It, I mean, it's, it's just incredible. The simplest way to describe it is to differentiate at two different types. And they're both natural, by the way. The, the type we're most familiar with nowadays is a byproduct of oil refining. And so when a barrel of oil goes into a refinery, the uh, refining process basically separates the oil into different units. Like the really light stuff, the boiling point might be just 100 degrees. And the really heavy stuff like asphalt, the boiling point is like a 1,000 degrees. And so a barrel of oil goes into a refinery and the the refinery just separates it into various products. And the the way that does that, that's really complex and it takes a long time to do that. But once you get the valuable stuff like gasoline out of a barrel of oil, you have leftover gunk. So a barrel of oil in in the refinery processes it into different products and some of the products are worth a lot like gasoline and some of the products are not worth very much and you've heard of the coke brothers right everybody has that that's their fortune they made their fortune in asphalt and they call asphalt bottoms in other words the gunk after you're done refining oil the thick gunk that's left over And so that thick gunk that's left over, that's what paves our roads. We mix that with aggregate, crushed stone, and then lay it out with machinery. And we have blacktop highways, blacktop roads, blacktop streets, blacktop playgrounds, blacktop running tracks, and and on and on and on. So that's one asphalt, a natural, it's a byproduct of oil refining. But it's still a natural product, even in the refinery, because you don't have to add anything. You just remove lighter hydrocarbons that produce, you know, gasoline and what's left over is asphalt. Now, asphalt also exists in nature. Okay. And essentially what it is, is oil that has lost much of its mass because of weathering, bacteria feeding on it and so forth. And so if you just think of like a a jar of or a can of paint, and you mix the paint up, it's liquid, you can pour it, right? But if you let it sit out, the can sit out in the sun, it'll start to harden. And eventually, it will be thick as peanut butter. That's essentially what happens to oil with asphalt. It thickens over time because it degrades, because bacteria have fed off the lighter hydrocarbons, weathering, all that kind of stuff. And in terms of the globe, you have natural asphalt deposits all over planet Earth. But the big ones are in the Western Hemisphere. Up in Alberta, Canada, the tar sands or oil sands, that's asphalt. And in Venezuela, of course, their oil industry is a mess. It's been a mess for quite a while. But their oil, much of it is essentially asphalt as well. But it's not really considered asphalt because Venezuela is close to the equator. And so it's warm. And so in the reservoir, you can kind of pump it out with asphalt up in Canada, further away from the reservoir is cold and the oil might be thick as a hockey puck. So you can't pump it out. In order to pump it out, you have to add chemicals or you heat it, you melt it and then pump it out. But in Venezuela, it's basically asphalt as well, because once that oil is on the surface, it'll solidify because on the surface, the temperature is lower than it is in the reservoir. And so you have these two absolutely enormous deposits of natural asphalt or very, very, very heavy oil in Canada and Venezuela, both Western Hemisphere. And you asked about the most surprising thing. Maybe the most surprising thing I found in the book is when we drive on roads, 
we might not like it, right? As environmentalists, because that, that prevents water from getting back into the ground. But at least asphalt pavement is not a carbon bomb. It's a carbon sink because it's never going to be burned. We don't burn roads, right? We burn gasoline, but we don't burn roads. And so that a- asphalt pavement is hydrocarbon. At least 5% of it is, but it's never going to be burned. And therefore it's a carbon sink. And that's kind of good. But here's what really got me up in Alberta when we melt or hack that asphalt, the oil companies that is, out of the ground. They add chemicals to it or they upgrade it to synthetic crude oil and they ship it down here to refineries. And so they turn it into gasoline. And so when you're driving your car, the asphalt under your car wheels, that's a carbon sink. But the asphalt that's powering your engine is a carbon bomb, right? It's it's like kind of an enabler. (laughs) That's correct, yeah. But again, this is actually a little bit complex because up in Alberta, when you, you and down in Venezuela, they call it diluted crude oil. But up in Alberta, they call it either dilbit, meaning diluted bitumen or diluted asphalt, or syncrude, asphalt that's been upgraded to synthetic crude oil. But regardless, they pump it down here to modern refineries. And the modern refineries prefer to get this gunk from Canada, or if it was available from Venezuela, because it's more profitable than getting light, sweet crude oil. And that's why a lot of our really light oil we export it nowadays, because our refineries are real modern, and they, the profit margins are better for dealing, again, with the Koch brothers called the garbage crudes. Yeah, I guess because you can sell all the excess, and then you just get rid of all the material you brought in, you would kick out in some form or fashion whether it's roads, whether it's oil, whether it's polymer Correct. products for polymers and things like that. There's still hydrocarbons. Yeah. But there's, there's a pecking oil. I mean, if you're going to refine oil into gasoline, you're going to have crud left over, really thick crud asphalt. So what are you going to do with it? You can throw it away. You're going to use it to pave roads. And that might not be great, but it's better than concrete roads. Concrete is a far more uh, of a pool than asphalt. And plus, asphalt is easy to recycle. Concrete is very difficult to recycle. Well, that was an interesting thing about the book, too, is that you were talking about recycling and recycling asphalt. All the asphalt you lay on streets and roads and blacktops, whatever, can be recycled, and, and, and it is. It's a Correct. relatively, it's not thrown away often. It's actually reused over and over and over again. Absolutely. Yeah. But one thing you got to realize with both asphalt and concrete or asphalt pavement, I should say, and concrete pavement, it's almost all stone, crushed rock. And for what we call asphalt pavement or blacktop, liquid asphalt is the binder, what holds the stones together. And for concrete, cement is the binder, uh, Portland cement. And a lot of people use the word cement and concrete interchangeably, but that's not accurate. Okay. But paving is is not just roads. It's airport runways. It's parking lots. It's just a million different things. Not literally a million, but many, many different things. When I did the book, I wanted to show that asphalt was more than just infrastructure. Infrastructure is a big part of the story, but it's more than that. On the other hand, infrastructure, roads, is like the 800-pound gorilla in, in the room. And so my book essentially has a division the world, and then America, before asphalt, before pavement, and then after pavement. Because we don't realize that pavement is both very old and very new. I mean, the Romans paved roads, but they basically used big, big stones. You had a few attempts to pave roads with binders like asphalt in the ancient world, but they're very, very limited. You don't really have pavement coming of age until around the late 19th century. And at that particular time, asphalt dominated, but asphalt in nature, in other words, in Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela, they would mine asphalt and and ship it in big chunks and then melt it and use it to pave roads. And then shortly thereafter, oil refining really blew up and Rockefeller and Standard Oil, and they started selling asphalt to paving companies. And so natural asphalt was pushed aside 
and asphalt produced in refineries is utterly dominated because they have certain advantages. In a refinery, you can manipulate asphalt far easier and you don't have to remove rocks and sticks and twigs and giant pieces of ice and things like that. Yeah, it was interesting to hear the story of those Trinidadian, kind of the, the lake, and who is it, Amzi Barber, that, yeah. that story about how they were trying to sell roads to the U.S. and all of the the history behind that. I mean, that's that's what's interesting to me is is the onset of roads, but also how they kind of got into the American establishment as a part of even the political process. I mean, this is something that is tied to a lot of politics, a lot of corruption, uh, oh, frankly, absolutely. and history. It's really fascinating to hear the stories of how basically you took this natural asphalt, but then eventually because of the refining process and oil usage, you get to you know the refinery asphalt, which kind of changes the game for those yeah. folks who are trying to take stuff out of you know Trinidad, for example. Yeah, yeah. Natural asphalt was basically a colonial prize. And that's Amesy Barber and those. He had one asphalt company and there were others. And you mentioned corruption. And when at the time asphalt was a colonial prize where British and American uh, business people, often with the backing of their governments, went into places like Venezuela and Trinidad in order to mine asphalt, take it back to the U.S. and use it to pave roads. Often they would go to the U.S. government and ask the U.S. government to send in, you know, Marines and warships to protect their business investments. And also on the municipal level, because most, now we have the interstate highway system today, but even today, most roads are not federal. They're state and they're local. And back then, roads were exclusively state and local. And so when paving came in with the AMZ Barbers and, you know, mining asphalt in Trinidad and Venezuela, what these guys focused on was winning urban municipal paving contracts. And that was corrupt as all get out. It was just absolutely ridiculous. And the way it worked is they would get the city councils and mayors to specify a certain type of asphalt. And only their company produced that particular type. And so they had like a de facto monopoly. And earlier you asked, you know, how do you define asphalt? And there is no specific definition, but you have general parameters about the chemistry, but that's, a, that's all they are, are general parameters. And so asphalt might differ from one location in the natural world or one particular refinery to another refinery, just like crude oil differs from one well to the next. But again, corruption was a big, big part of this book. I noticed I noticed that a fair amount, uh, especially, you know, you go into obviously presidential administrations and Spiro Agnew and the kickbacks when I guess he was the governor of Maryland. Yes. And that had to do with engineering companies and highway contracts for both asphalt and concrete roads in, in that case. I mean, even it's not quite, it's on a, it's boundary, but I, you know, even reading about Elaine Chow being on the board of a paving company before she became the secretary. too, yeah, Vulcan material. And then still having a stake in it when she was the secretary of transportation. I, it makes me wonder, you know, <laughs> why well, all that I mean, money from transit goes to roads. Yeah, uh, well, Elaine Chow, <laughs> Mitch McConnell, I, I don't know about you, but I'm shocked. Right? <laughs> I'm shocked, shocked. <laughs> Yeah, and and by the way, Iran Contra, one of the uh, sideshow guys in Iran Contra, was in the asphalt business too. And so, no matter where you look, it pops up, and you get this crazy stuff too. The Reagan administration during the 1980s, you know, they didn't like the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and of course, anti-communism and all that. But one thing that got in Ronald Reagan's bonnet, as my grandmother used to say was that the Russians helped the Sandinistas pave asphalt roads in Managua and other places in Nicaragua. And that got Ronald Reagan all upset. And it's little things like that that just keep popping up in the book in doing the research. You just never know where it's going to. And of course, the Russians were no geniuses when it comes to paving. They would pave over frozen ground. And you don't do that. It doesn't work. It'll no. Last, oh, yeah. The end of the season. And we did it, too, in wartime, too. During the Korean War, we the Air Force would pave over frozen ground. And that's real temporary. A runway might last, you know, 10 days. Then you have to redo it. You mentioned the CBs a number of times, the Navy uh, engineers. Is that something that you were interested in beforehand? Well, well he, sort of. Yeah. I mean, my oldest boy I just got promoted to captain in the U.S. Navy, so it's pretty cool. And my dad was PT boat during World War II, and he knew some CBs. 
Yeah, what struck me about the Seabees is the massive amount of construction they did, did all sorts of construction. But I focus on their use of roads and run, especially runways in the, in the Pacific Islands. And so we use a lot of asphalt on, in, on the Atlantic front. I mentioned you know, the amount of asphalt that landed with the troops at D-Day. But that's actually teeny tiny to the amount of paving we did in the Pacific. Uh, we would Some of those islands would basically pave a whole island. And so you would have uh, these enormous runways. Like, uh, it, one runway could be up to two miles long. And you have one island, you might have like 10 runways and bombers taken off every six minutes. And the reason you have to pay them, if you don't pay them, you got too much dust. You know, a, a bomber takes off and you got to wait 20 minutes for the next one to take off. But if you pave it, they can take off continually. You have no logistical issues other than, you know, the capacity of the planes and all that. And in some areas where we didn't have, like I had part of the book, World War II in China, where the USA is is building runways in China and they didn't have asphalt. And so they would use water to keep the dust down, but it doesn't work very well. And so the generals are all upset. He says, you know, in this other area of the war, we can take off heavy bombers every six minutes. And here we got, we can't every 30 or 40 minutes because we got to wait for the dust to come down. So it, it just played an absolutely enormous role. But then again, what do those asphalt runways do? They allowed us to kill more people. Yeah. World War II is a good cause. Well, Hitler had to be stopped. Tojo had to be stopped. But it's still really, really violent. And so, in other words, without pavement, those bombs don't get delivered. And that goes from the Enola Gate on down to the you know, most humble B-17. And so asphalt is responsible you know, for a lot of death in the world, or for a lot of violence in the world. And that goes from war, bombing, to car crashes, motorcycles, pedestrian deaths, bicycle deaths. You know, Lawrence of Arabia died on asphalt. He survived Arabia, but he didn't survive a motorcycle crash with two kids on bicycles. Hmm. And he hit his head on blacktop and died. And it connects also to, you know, what Eisenhower talked about in the military industrial complex and kind of the war machine, you know, transferring uh, almost into, you know, multifaceted machine of building things in the U.S. And so that, you know, the discussion about uh, building the interstate highways and his kind of shock that Congress decided to go through cities instead of around them. Right. Yeah. But there's a whole other story related to that, too, in, in terms of kind of the machine that was started early on with the Good Roads Movement and then continued through the after the Second World War. Yeah, and a lot of the interstate, the, the, the rationale behind the interstate highways is to be able to move the troops around, but also to evacuate cities in case of, you know, nuclear attack, global thermal nuclear war. Now, the interstate highways and the asphalt story is a little bit tricky because the interstate highways are predominantly concrete. That's changing a little now. The percentage of the interstates that are asphalt is rising and the percentage that are concrete is slowly uh, shrinking but they're still predominantly concrete. But nonetheless, there's a godzillion miles of interstate highway that are, that are asphalt pavement and not concrete. And the decision to move the uh, interstates through the cities, yeah, that was kind of, I, I kind of knew that as an historian, but to get into the nitty gritty of the details there. And Eisenhower was simply out to lunch on that. He actually, his instincts were actually really on point in that you run the interstates around the cities. And so you don't destroy the cities. But he wasn't paying attention. You know, he's got other things to do, other, you know, bigger fish to fry. And so by the time he started paying attention, it was too late. And what happened is, is mayors, big city mayors, used the interstates as gigantic public works projects, but also slum clearance. Yeah. And the irony, of course, is the interstates, when they were put right through central cities, yeah, they, they cleared out slums, but they also cleared out, you know, working class and middle class white people who could now flee to the suburbs because you could live 20 miles from your factory now and get there in 20 minutes because of the interstates. So it's just an absolute, an utter, complete disaster. And for most of the uh, interstate construction, the phrase at the time was white man's roads through black man's homes. 
But it wasn't just African Americans that got displaced by interstate construction. So I have a little bit in the book about Los Angeles and Chavez Ravine and Dodger Stadium. And so a lot of urban renewal, interstate construction and so forth also displaced Hispanic people, Mexican Americans and others. It's like every time asphalt turned up in my research, I was kind of surprised. You know, I mean, to learn that, for example, Dodger Stadium on the Thirst Bay side parking lot, there's a Hispanic grade school buried. It's still there. It's buried down there. Now, you mentioned the military industrial comp. Asphalt is a key part of that, but it's the inexpensive part. Asphalt is really cheap. It's really because it's basically garbage. After you're done refining uh, crude oil, it's garbage. But you can use it to pave roads. It doesn't cost very much. And yet, without asphalt, do you really have a military industrial complex? One of the things I found, Chalmers Johnson, he alerted me to this before he died. And there's a public report called uh, the Pentagon's Bait or Department of Defense Base Structure Report. And it's an inventory of the Pentagon's real property, you know, the hundreds of bases around the world and so forth. And, um, one of the things they really emphasize in there are roads and parking lots and airstrips and runways. Because what good does it do you to have a military base if you can't park, if you can't have your aircraft take off and land? And so a big part of the Pentagon, maybe the most valuable part of the Pentagon, has to do with asphalt. And so on one base structure report on the cover, you got an asphalt roller. And then it shows you, you know, we, we own, you know, 5,000 buildings around the world and all this stuff. But for the Pentagon, too, back in the 50s, by the way, I'm segueing here. I hate that word. I just used it to a slightly different topic. Back in the 50s, the Air Force mandated that all runways for jets and bombers be uh, concrete. And there's a big fight over that. You got a fight between the concrete lobby and the asphalt lobby. And eventually, the asphalt lobby got them to roll that back. Because the good thing about asphalt, you can build a road or runway like almost immediately. You don't have any downtime. You can just roll it out. A few hours later, you can drive on it, or a jet can take off, or a bomber can take off from it. Whereas concrete, uh, much more expensive to construct. And the downtime is much longer. After you finish a concrete runway, you got to wait. It's got a cure, C-U-R-E, it's got a cure. And so a lot of the military engineers love asphalt because they can do things immediately, very, very quickly. Concrete has its own advantages. It lasts longer. Uh, but it's, again, much more expensive and very difficult to recycle, especially if you put, you know, the rebar in it, right? reinforced concrete. That's really rough to recycle. I wanted to also ask you about kind of the environmental connection because, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of the embedded carbon in the asphalt itself, and it's not getting burned. But then there's the issues of runoff and other environmental connections. I'm curious what the impact is of asphalt on, say, runoff. I mean, in the book, you talk about how if it's spread over with tar oil, it's not a good thing because that gets in the water. But I've always wondered, you know, if you're running water over asphalt, and it has these properties, uh, it has, you know, some fossil fuel properties, is that bad for, you know, water and uh, runoff as well? Right. Yeah. You've got two issues there with runoff. Okay. And the one issue is flooding because the more acreage you pave, the less natural floodplain you have. And so flooding is a gigantic issue and pavement drives a lot of the other issue you have is, is runoff. And it's not the asphalt itself that poses the problem with runoff. It's what drips onto the asphalt. So leakage from car radiators and all sorts of things, chemicals. And yet that gets into water and there's, there's almost nothing that you can do about that. It can be remediated to a degree, but that, that is an enormous problem. And so creeks, lakes, streams, even the Great Lakes runoff from parking lots, highways, it gets into the groundwater or gets right into tributaries for or major rivers. But those both have to be looked at in, in conjunction. Uh, asphalt pavement, asphalt and other pavement causes flooding problems and then runoff of pollutants. The asphalt itself is not a particular pollutant, but the runoff is. Now, you mentioned the word tar earlier. All right. Now, tar is, is very different. 
asphalt is a natural substance. Tar is not. It's a man-made substance. And uh, often you, what you see in playgrounds and in driveways, a very dark black co- coating, that's coal tar. Now, coal tar is, is more carcinogenic by about a thousand percent than asphalt. But it looks better. You get that nice deep black color that doesn't fade to gray so fast. So when you have an asphalt surface, the runoff is mainly the stuff that drips on asphalt. Like again, the easiest example, drippings from a car radiator. But for a coal tar surface, you've got a problem, both what drips onto the surface and the coal tar itself. And people like coal tar because it looks good and it lasts, but it's, it's much more dangerous. And a few uh, states have actually banned it right now. And again, that's for your podcast. That, that's a good topic for a, a future guest because there's a movement to get coal tar banned universally. And I don't have a global law, but I would bet a nickel that eventually we're not going to be uh, coding driveways and playgrounds and parking lots with coal tar. It'll go. And by the way, when I was little and they paved with asphalt, it really, really stunk. You just smelled a mile away. Now, it still doesn't smell yeah. great, but <laughs> nothing like it used to because in way, way back, they used to use coal tar to, you know, to mix it in with the asphalt. They don't do that anymore in this country. We fade that out. They still allow coal, coal tar coatings, right? So you've got asphalt looks beat up. And so you put a coating of coal tar on it. And, and that's kind of dangerous. Whereas if you would coat it with asphalt, then you only have to worry about the pollutants that are dripping on it. Well, that's interesting. I mean, if you make something blacker, it also takes in more sun. You have, and you mentioned earlier the heat island effect, and that's something we talk about on the show a number of times. Um, we've had guests on to talk about heat, and that's an impact as well. I mean, if you have yeah. so much pavement and it's all black in cities, then you heat up the city to a certain amount. Yeah, that's that's not good, and that that goes with the lack of vegetation and trees. In other words, in, in cities where you have a lot of pavement, you also don't have many trees. So that's like a multiplier for the heat island effect. We, you know, as a country, and we're making some progress there with, you know, green roofs and things like that. But a lot of that is tied to income. And you see studies practically every year, a new study comes out that says in in areas where the average income is low, there are very few trees, very, almost no green roofs in areas, urban areas where income is high, you have vegetation, you have trees, and you have quite a few green roofs. So that's, you know, all hooked in this. You know, asphalt can be seen as a, a socioeconomic uh, marker on many levels, environmental, but also on, you know, like uh, I have a section about basketball. Suburban kids they have asphalt driveways, right? And city kids don't have that, but they have playgrounds. And yet in some cities, the basketball hoops are left up in the playgrounds for kids to play. And in other cities, the basketball hoops are taken down because the police and mayors sometimes see asphalt basketball courts at schools and playgrounds as uh, magnets for crime and drugs and violence and all that. And so they pull the rims down. So in urban America now, in many cities, there's a basketball court, but there's no rim. The backboard's up. You can still see the lines, right, and the free throw line, but there ain't no rim because they take the rim, the rims down as a crime-fighting tool. Hmm. In other cities, exact, exactly the opposite. They keep the rims up, and they want the kids to have an outlet for energy because young people have high energy. <laughs> And so uh, I'm researching asphalt, and I grew up playing basketball on asphalt courts, and, and I was just shocked to see that. And then, of course, you have racists, too. Who are black, but basketball is not exclusively a black game. It's a global game. But in the minds of some you know, white supremacists, it's, it's a black game. And so you have racist vandalism, too, pulls rims down in, in cities so kids can't play. So this, you know, just asphalt pops up everywhere. And it's never the major player. But without asphalt, a lot of these things don't happen. I mean, uh, what, I have a line in the book. You want to understand America, you need to understand two things. Bombs abroad, cars at home. 
You don't have bombers without asphalt runways. You don't have cars without asphalt roads. You know, yeah, you could have all concrete runways, but you don't. Most of them are asphalt. And you could have all concrete roads, but you don't. 94% of them are asphalt. So that's America. Bombs abroad, cars at home. The last question I want to ask you is about kind of the spiritual connection of asphalt. And historically, I mean, we have instances discussing hell and damnation. You have Dante's Inferno and Milton's Paradise yeah. Lost. That was really interesting to me as well, just kind of how asphalt played into kind of our initial thoughts about hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I like. And Milton is just such a great writer. I mean, he's just absolutely amazing. And in the Middle East, Mesopotamia and the biblical lands and all that, you have the Dead Sea. Way back then, and the Dead Sea still does this, but the Dead Sea bubbles up asphalt chunks. But now they tend to be teeny tiny. But back in the day, the Dead Sea would bubble up an asphalt chunk like as big as a football field. And you would have people fighting over that. It would be a prize because you could chop off chunks and you know sell it to the embalmers in Egypt. So you had an asphalt trade. And that was just, just absolutely amazing. And, be, and, and you also had asphalt pits, natural asphalt pits scattered across, you know, what is today Iraq and Iran and so forth. And, you know, you could get stuck in them, much like prehistoric mammals got stuck in lower brea tar pits. And, and Gertrude Bell, she chronicled them. If, you, if your listeners don't know who she was, she was one of the people who helped construct the borders of Iraq, Winston Churchill and Percy Cox and them. And Percy Cox took his riding stick and scratched out lines in the sand. And Gertrude Bell came, came through with her compasses and protractors. And, you know, then you get the borders of Iraq. But she also chronicled asphalt pits in Iraq and the British British Empire. Uh, they were interested in any sort of hydrocarbon because, as we know, the British England ain't got no oil, right? None. So they were incredibly interested in that. And so you look at that holy land that Gertrude Bell chronicled more modern times than British oil companies chronicled. And then you go way back. Yeah, that is still there. And so it becomes a real image. And under certain conditions, asphalt methane can produce bubbles, right? Like it's boiling and can look really scary. And so it's not real surprising it became an image for for hell and damnation and all that stuff. And it's good for the Bible scribes, a great thing to write about too. Right? You can add some pizzazz to uh, you know, your literary style. But no one is better than Milton about that. I use one of his quotes about asphalt and the you know, the mouth of hell, two different times in the book. And it was just uh, in the beginning and then in the chapter where we're dealing with spirituality and good guys and bad guys. Most cultures use asphalt as a symbol of sort of evil. But not all cultures did because asphalt is just terribly useful. It makes it utterly, you, know, you can use it for just so many things you know, glue, construction material. And this was true, you know, three, four, five, six thousand years ago. And it remains true today. And given its duality as a sometimes a positive, sometimes a negative in the future, what's a good outcome for you for asphalt generally? Well, like all hydrocarbons, the, the, a good future would that they go away, <laughs> that we leave them in the ground, right? And now is that li li liable to, likely to happen? Uh, probably not. Um, so a good future would be that you, we don't produce any more liquid asphalt. We leave natural asphalt in the ground, and that includes Canada and Venezuela, and that we don't produce any more liquid asphalt in oil refineries because we have no more oil refineries because we've gone to renewable energy. Well, you'll still need to pave. And so if we can become more efficient about how much road space we need and all that, then maybe recycle asphalt. And when you just, when you utterly have to pave, maybe use that recycled uh, material. And again, almost all asphalt can be recycled. But I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. That, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a tough, that's, a, that's a tough question. And, you know, even, you know, like environmentalists, they want to ride, you know, like me, like you want to ride our bikes, bicycles. Yeah, but if you have to commute five miles to work, you don't want to ride on a dirt road. You want pavement. You want a bike path. 
And so it's very hard to get away from asphalt, no matter what your politics are, what your values are. It is very difficult. In fact, some of the first asphalt paving was for bicycles, not cars. In fact, that's what, and bicycles used to be such a big thing when they, they came out. You had the high wheelers with the giant front wheel on the wheel back of the wheel, and then eventually the safety bicycle, which looks like bicycles, sort of like they look today. And it was just enormous, and there was tremendous pressure on governments, state governments, and, f- and the federal government to pave for bicycles because uh, with, with ruts, mud and dust and ruts, it's very hard to ride a bicycle. But once you pave it, then people could go. And people, just like today, they want to get out of the cities. And so by the late 19th century, you, you have a little bit of paving in the cities, especially on the East Coast. And so for bicycle enthusiasts, that was great. But there's like no paving out on the country roads. And so you're going to ride a bicycle and you're going to deal with a, a rut that's hard as concrete and two feet deep. Right. Are you going to deal with mud that's two feet deep? No, you can't ride your bicycle. So the big pavement lobby actually began through bicyclists and not the automobile. And of course, that changed in the blink of an eye. The automobile became dominant and the bicycle lobby faded, not into oblivion, but it truly faded. On the other hand, it's coming back now. We want more bike paths. And you see that with our roads, right? Paved roads and you have those bike lanes now. Mm -hmm. Even a bike lane on Pennsylvania Avenue. And when Obama was president, he had uh, bike share stations, even on the White House grounds. And of course, Trump, President Trump took them out. Again, I'm shocked. (laughs) Well, the book is called Asphalt, A History. Where can folks find it if they want to get a copy? You can uh, University of Nebraska Press, Amazon, and pretty much anywhere. You can go to my website too, kennethoreilly.com. And so you can buy it pretty much anywhere. And again, I Googled to see how it's doing. And literally, you can buy it in a hundred different places. And so I'm happy about that. University press books sometimes do really well, and sometimes it's hard to get them in the bookstores. For this book, probably the really good bookstores will have it, uh, but not all bookstores will have it. And and that's been my history as a writer. Once in a while, I'll be in uh, Costco or Walmart, and I'll see one of my books. But more often, you know, every third bookstore will have it, not every one. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. One, one of my books, I wrote a book once on the FBI and the Civil Rights Movement. And in New York City, I went in for a book signing and they brought my book out on a little hand truck, you know, like maybe 70, 80 copies. And at the time, uh, I think it was Howard Stern and Cole and Powell had their books coming out and they had to take down the wall and they brought their books in and forked their <laughs> But people are still reading that book. I don't know. They ain't reading their books anymore. Maybe not. Maybe not. And, yeah. The number of uh, <laughs> sales sometimes doesn't indicate the importance of a book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Kenneth, thanks for joining us. We really, really appreciate your time. All right. It was great. Thanks for inviting me. Tom.